Hi, my name is Alexandra. My name is Emily. And this is the Novel Tea Podcast. Where we talk about books and drink tea. Exactly. So we have to kick it off. What tea are you drinking today? I am drinking Harney and Son's Murder on the Orient Express, which I overthink because it has a gunpowder flavor to it. And the first time I drank it, I was like, oh. but the victim in the Murder on the Orient Express was, was stabbed. stabbed a bunch of times. And then I realized that's, that is overthinking that's, it. That's overthinking it. I've got some English breakfast today. You have a gigantic portion of English breakfast and it's my duty to help her drink it down. Because I only have 250 tea bags right now. Yeah. Only. Yeah. All right. So for today, this is our first episode of our podcast. <laughs> And funny story, so I don't know if anybody else uses this app. It's an app called Marco Polo, but we use it a, mu a bunch in our friend group too. It's a huge, yeah, it's a huge bonus. Yeah, to do, you just have conversations, little group video messages. And one day we got on the subject of the Tenant of Wild Fahal by Anne Bronte, because I had read it maybe like a year previous and you were in the middle of reading it, I believe, or had just finished it. No, actually I re read it because you recommended it. Oh. I had read <laughs> recently the... Um, Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society book in which yeah. they made the untruthful statement that uh, Anne Bronte was better than Charlotte Bronte. Ah. And at the time I was like, okay, Maybe. I'm interested because I love Charlotte Bronte. It was a lie. Of okay. course. But I'm not saying Anne Bronte is not good, I think but Charlotte, like yeah. no one beats Charlotte. I think Anne Bronte has historically been underrated and underappreciated. I think when you, yeah, like, like Emily and Charlotte do get all the attention. Yeah. But also, you like whenever someone's like, "Should we really be saying that this person?" Is, I'm like, history might be right. Like yeah, we that's probably fair. shouldn't ignore history. Yeah. <laughs> and so as we're having this conversation, it becomes very apparent that we approach reading books from very different perspectives. Yeah, I think we were both like, "Why are you reading the book that way?" <laughs> yeah. What? Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And it just gave me, and especially too, because like I, as you guys know, if you've been on my channel or whatever, I come from like a traditional English degree, literary background. And so like all of the people and all of the academic settings, like this is just how you read books because doy, but Emily's bringing a totally different perspective. I come from the perspective of I'm a freelance editor and so... I'm always thinking of it in terms of the writing aspect and like what the author owes to the reader and how the author needs to function within the promise that they're making that they're either writing a novel or writing a genre fiction. Like that's my like main rule when I start with editing is like, what are you trying to write? You need to stay true to that first. And then we can talk about like what your format is, what your, you know, what right. your ideas are and stuff. So like, yeah, like this is like, a totally different way of reading a novel. I honestly have never read it from an academic perspective. So like when you started coming up with stuff, I was like, okay, yeah, that is there. I didn't notice that. Yeah. yeah and I think, you know, the, the academic perspective is always sort of like, well, what is the reader? owe the book here. Let me scooch in. Um, and you know, and, and especially because there's such this high, you know, idealism placed around classics and Brontes and, the, and Jane Austen and all of these authors who we know and love, you know, you kind of, there's a sense in which like there for so long in my reading life, like I never even thought about whether I liked the book or not, which you have brought I back into my life, <laughs> yeah. honestly, because you, you just have a very strong sense of yourself and what you like and what works for you and what doesn't. And like, it's almost like, oh, that's not even a legitimate question. <laughs> yeah. What, who cares what you think about the book? It's Anne Bronte, untouchable. Yeah. You know? I mean, like, I do think that there's legitimacy in reading things that have historic value and, you know, yeah. meaning. And this is, like, important to history. But I can never get away from the, like, okay, but, but like, like it, does it function as a good story? Right. Like, like do I like the story? Because, like, that's, I mean, I can't help it, but that's just, like, first and foremost, like, like, well, are we, are we trying to write a novel here? Is that what we're going for? Are we going for something else? And you fundamentally know? at the end of the day, no matter how <laughs> academic your perspective may be, like we read books for entertainment. We're sitting down with a book because we should be enjoying ourselves because we should be loving it because, and yes, it's nice to get like a deeper meaning out of the book or it enriches your life or, or you see where it belongs in history and right. why we still have this book when a lot of books have like 
fallen away and we don't remember them at all. Yeah. But I have definitely in the past like been like, no, you must only read classics. <laughs> um, and so, you know, this is new year, new me. There you go. And I'm reading more non-classics and, uh, but I still, you know, I love thinking about literature in a, in a deeper way. What does it mean? Well, and What's I, below like, the surface? It was like interesting also to explore Anne Bronte because like I knew, I know Charlotte fairly well. I've read some of uh, Emily's work. I'm not as big a fan as of Emily as I am Charlotte, but I I, I actually like Anne better than Emily. I, I go Charlotte Anne. For and me, like Emily. I've so I've read portions of Wuthering Heights. I I read it it's first as an ebook, and I struggle with like finishing ebooks. I've learned that about myself. It's not well. Like I felt like there was a lot of good atmosphere, and the story was interesting. I just couldn't like any of the characters. Yeah, they're very unlikable. And it's true, it's very hard for me to get into a plot line where I'm kind of like, okay, but you're just like all a total are, jerks. Yeah, all you y'all know? are big meanies. Yeah, so like I feel like. That's like the best part about Charlotte is her characters. Like, even like a Mr. Rochester, who's a very rough character, you're still like, I so feel for you, yeah. you know. And I think that's what Charlotte brings more than any of the other sisters is characters where you just really, really get sucked yeah. into their stories. Tis true. I agree. Okay, but let's give a summary of Tenant of Wildfell Hall. So set the stage for us. Who do we start off with? I mean, we definitely have to start with Gilbert because yeah. the book starts with Gilbert. And he's like a, you know, well, prominent figure in his community, a young man who's like, you know, well known in his community and kind landowner. of like landowner, landowner, kind of the gentleman of the community, gentleman farmer. Yeah. But also just like a little bit of a playboy too. Mm-hmm. Like you kind of get that impression. Yeah. Like the ladies like him and he likes the ladies and yeah. he's fine with having, and he's like a, not ready to commit. Yeah. But he's yeah. still like flirting around. Yeah, and his mom is like, oh, we need to be settling down here. We need yes. to be thinking. He's kind of like, well, I'm still having fun. Yeah. You know, until? Until Helen comes into the picture. Who's this? Sweeps onto the pages in a very yeah. dramatic fashion for this small community that clearly is, like, accustomed to everything being the same. Right. All the same people, you know, the same houses are occupied. Wildfell Hall is not occupied. Indeed. So she becomes the tenant of Wildfell Hall, and of course she's dramatically beautiful. She's much more sophisticated than the other women. She's an artist, a professional, so she's working. Much which more is, mature, too, from yeah. like a lot of the women that he's accustomed to being around. Right. She is um, very much clearly learned, especially around issues of like feminism and what was being talked about at the time with like the role of women in society and even suffrage and things like that. And so she brings this whole new perspective into the community that's sort of shocked and appalled by and the other all ladies to say. do not like how interested Gilbert is in this. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and, but you know, and she's this dark beauty and oh my gosh, Gilbert absolutely falls for her. Yeah. And it does have like I feel like and this is something that like obviously Emily and Charlotte have a heavier influence our atmosphere very very gothic but i still feel like the at least the opening portion of um tenant is which is also my favorite portion like the the opening gilbert's narrative is my favorite part of the whole story Mm -hmm. um but i feel like it does still have kind of a gothic atmosphere even though none of the the elements of the story are really gothic yeah you do have this you know ramshackle, huge tenant Wildfell Hall that's right. not been occupied, the mystery of who is Helen. And she's also a bit standoffish. We don't quite know what her history is. And but so you do you have, get like a sense of like there's something there. Something there's some not mystery right. about Helen. Yeah, and she has her son, and then there's also another gentleman in the community who's definitely circling around Helen and Gilbert's very jealous. Um Ludgate. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. And I and I mean, a huge part of that opening is Gilbert himself maturing. Mm -hmm. Because at the opening of the book, he's, you know, he even though for his age level, I feel like he's, you know, a little bit prone to his own emotions taking Mm -hmm. over things pretty easily. And so I think that's a huge part of the story is, like, Helen, honestly, is more mature than Gilbert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And she's seen a lot more life than he is, as we will discover later in the novel. Which is unique in and of itself, because Mm -hmm. usually in these books, like, the man has seen much more of life. He's been out and about in the world more. And that is not true of of Helen and Gilbert. Like, Gilbert's honestly more sheltered. Yeah. And there are a lot of things that, that creates the tension a lot of times in their relationship, in fact. Which I do think they have good romantic tension. And like you said, that first part of the story, which is much more... Um, narratively traditional leading up to the declarations of love and are they going to get together? Are they not? Who, you know, um, and we should say, uh, we're going to talk about this. Yeah. Spoilers. There will be, it's okay. 
It was published in what, like 1850, 1848. Yeah. So we feel like it's legitimate to spoil it at this yeah. point. Yeah, so if you do not want to be spoiled, if you don't want to know the details, the nitty gritty, the ending of this book, for example, this isn't going to be the show no, for you. Don't. Because we're going to get into a lot of details. Stop now. Yeah. <laughs> you have been warned. Also, okay, I won't get into criticizing people about like, <laughs> wanting just... to be not spoiled for books that are like 100 plus years old. So anyway, 200 plus. Anyway, whatever. we're not quite at 200 yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. Anyway, so um, then we get into the portion of the story that is from Helen's perspective. Right, because Gilbert's like, why can't you love me? Yeah. And, and Helen's like, here's my diary. Yeah. Here's the reason why. Right. Which is like what an interesting like format in and of itself. Like yeah. we switch very dramatically from Gilbert's narrative to Helen's, Helen's narrative. narrative. And then we're also going back in time. We're getting her from like 18, much more closer to the present time. So we get like both her history and also her perspective, which her voice has been, you know, pretty much silent other than what Gilbert reports For she two. says. Right. Now we get from her perspective. Yeah. Which is also, like, much as we've seen Gilbert start to mature, now we get to see Helen and how she matures. Because right. at 18, obviously, she's almost, I would say, like a typical 18-year-old. Yeah. You know, very romantic, yeah. has a lot of idealistic ideas about, like, what romantic relationships should be like. Which, when you start out with Helen at 18 like that, and you've already seen how dramatically different Helen is, you're just like, well, okay. we're going to go happen. on a journey here. <laughs> We're, we have point B to get to, and that is far from where we are right now. Exactly. So 18-year-old Helen is, she's still very beautiful, and in a lot of ways she is very serious still. She's very serious about her faith. She's a starting artist. She has this artistic talent, and she falls in love with Arthur Huntington, who is smoking hot. And very charismatic in comparison to the other men right. in her life who, like, she, like, nicknames boredom and things like that. Like, right. she's, he's, she he's has smart, a sense of, he's like... He's witty, but he's also quite irreverent, and he's not as moral as she is, and he's not serious about his faith the way that she is. And so, of course, in her 18 year mind, she's like, yes, I can marry him, I can reform him, and then we, we can have this beautiful life together. Swept up in the romance of it. Yeah. Whereas, like, people in the background are like... This um, guy might not be the best match for you. Maybe. He's yeah. kind of a playboy, and he kind of has a drinking problem. Like, But she's a romantic 18-year-old girl, and yeah. he's very handsome and charismatic. And surely these things can all just be smoothed out. Yeah, and in a world where men have so much power and so much freedom to do whatever they want, they have all of the property. She is considered property once they get right. married, which they do get a, end up getting married. And so very quickly we get into a relationship that's toxic, that's abusive. And Anne, um, it, Bronte is exploring some really dark themes that is really not talked about in Victorian literature, even after she kind of broached it for a long time. Especially from approach. the perspective of the female. Exactly. And what she is experiencing in this society. Yeah. This was very much a like, oh, we don't need to go there type of subject. Right. Um, and so we have issues of infidelity with Arthur very quickly. He starts having an affair with another beautiful woman who's sort of in their social circle. And as mentioned, he has an alcohol problem. And a very big alcohol problem. Yeah. yeah that's very prominent. Yeah. And then as a result of that, increasing physical abuse and emotional abuse for her. And also, she ultimately what happens for Helen is they have a kid together and Helen's just not willing to raise her son in such a toxic environment. Because he's also bringing a lot of people into their life that mm -hmm. are basically just versions of himself. So yeah. she's not only dealing with him, she's surrounded by people who are just like him. And right. it's a very, it's basically traumatic, like day to day is trauma for her. Right. And so she ends up starting to build a plan of how is she, as an abused woman, going to escape with her son. And this is a narrative that in a lot of ways reads very modern because lots of women go through this experience and it's still, with the power dynamic that we still have today, very difficult for women to leave. And so oh, absolutely, like a hundred times back then. Yeah, like, like this is a society in which a woman of her status is going to be considered like bringing her family down if she tries to support herself. Like, it would right. be a shame to her family if she attempts to support herself. Yeah. Which is just messed up. Yeah. And so in this process, we learn that she's able to escape. She gets away. Her brother helps her. She ends up going to Wildfell Hall. She sets up as this professional planter, and that pretty much brings us up to the present time. And Gilbert's like, oh, you Done. can't marry me because you're still married. <laughs> this is a problem. Big at me. Not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, and I think that matures Gilbert even yeah. more because now he's faced with a like, I have something I really, really want and I can't have it. Mm-hmm. And do I move on and just let her go? Or do I remain faithful to my feelings for her, even mm-hmm. though I can't have her? Right. And there is a moment where Gilbert kind of proposes this idea, but like we love each other, we respect each other, we have this connection of mind, we really are kindred souls. He's a much better match for Helen than Arthur is, where he's like, well, but maybe we just are together anyway. And she, she's like, no, <laughs> did you not? <laughs> I, my faith is very important to me. She's very serious, a Christian. She's like, did you not hear all of the sacrifice that I'm willing to go through for like my morals, for what I stand up for. And also for it to be an example to her son. Exactly. I'm not going to have this sort of quasi adulterous relationship or this friendship that's like fraught with rom- romantic tension for you. Like it's going to be a tor- torment for both of us. I like see, yeah. we need to not do this until, you know, cause she obviously has feelings for him. Yeah. Like it's not a one sided yeah, thing. Yeah, absolutely. So then, um, Arthur Huntington, her, wedded husband who she hasn't had contact with for a very long time he's finally gotten to the point where his alcoholism has riddled his body he's He's caught up with him right his partying ways and he is basically on his deathbed and so she graciously goes back into his life to take care of him kind of in his final weeks years this man is still the father of her son they Mm -hmm. still have a connection she did love him yeah like it's not like it was like a forced marriage or an arranged marriage like I don't think that you can say, like, Helen doesn't have feelings for Arthur still. Like, there is still a connection there. Yeah, I agree. And she certainly feels a sense of duty and obligation as a wife to at least be in his life for this, to ease this, what is clearly going to be the end of his life. I mean, and to be fair, like, she's not going back into a dangerous situation at Mm -hmm. this point. Like, this is not returning to an abusive husband. He can't can't really hurt her in that way anymore. So... We're certainly not saying, like, just return to the abusive husband. Like, this is a very different situation. Right. The power dynamic has certainly flipped because of how um, just attenuated he is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then ultimately he (laughs) dies. So now Helen is single. Eventually Gilbert finds out about this. He goes to visit her. And then he's like, oh, snap. You're way wealthier than I thought you were. (laughs) (laughs) Like, (laughs) Because she turns out to be basically the heiress for her family, her uncle, I think Mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, so... Yeah, he even though they're both of, like, the gentleman's class, it's clear that her wealth... It's sort of like a, a Lizzie Bennet-Darcy situation where Darcy, even though they're of the same class technically, they, Darcy is so much wealthier than her right. family. Um, and he comes from a much more agrarian society exactly. where manners are... Like, you know, yeah. things are more relaxed in his community, and she's, like, of a, like particularly high class and it's like that's the first time that that strikes him (laughs) yeah and so and then she's she's sort of annoyed with gilbert because she's like we have we're kindred souls we have this bond of the heart surely this overcomes this social dynamic that is just created by men that has nothing to do with like our soul love for each other and then they ultimately get together they get married yada yada happily ever after after. right the end so that's the (laughs) summary of the story it's a great little love story But that doesn't mean that we love everything about it. So maybe, like, give me your gripes on the structure of the book. Well, I have to say to start with, like, in a way, this book makes me angry because this book proves to me that Anne Bronte can write. Yeah, she has... She she does. She has the capacity to write a good novel. Complex characters, romantic tension, interesting characters, interesting concepts. Atmosphere, she's able to lay that on. Like, especially the first portion of the book, which is Gilbert's narrative... I had no issues through that. Like, I thought that was a great build-up. The mystery of Helen is handled very well, where you're intrigued all the way through. It's when we get to Helen's narrative, which is first person, her diary, that I think things start to fall apart for me because it, at that point, starts to violate my concept of, like, this is a novel, and so it needs to function as a novel. And I honestly did not know that much about Anne before reading this, but even not knowing that much about Anne, there were plenty of times where I was like, Helen is no longer here. Anne is here to give her speech on things. She has something to say. Say, yeah. <laughs> and then we go back to Helen. And that really is like the place where I get frustrated because there are moments throughout Helen's narrative where we're suddenly writing an essay on her feelings towards alcoholism. We're suddenly writing an essay on her feelings towards you know adultery uh, and stuff. Yeah. Which, Marital then, abuse, yeah, etc. These ideas that she's putting in there are not illegitimate. They're absolutely legitimate in her time era, like they needed to be addressed. But 
if you're wanting to write an essay, write an essay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Don't work your essays yeah. into what you're saying is a narrative. I do think that that is an issue that you get into when you're trying to do the, like, this is not a novel, this is a, a, a diary where I'm trying to write my story. That's a very difficult thing to pull off legitimately. Yeah, epistolary novels are... I have always felt like epistolary novels are clunky. I've kind of criticized them in other places. And really early on, they're, they're quite common in the early iterations that we get of English novel writing, like from its inception. And so if we're kind of looking at the history of how like novels came to be novels as opposed to like epic poetry or something like that, you know, we're going back to um, Gulliver's Travels, which is a narrative written by a man who is a journalist who's like, what if I made up a fake story though? And like, he kind of has this journal type But writes it as, I'm 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 going to the Lilliputians now. We're wearing like to see original like travel writing in a weird way. (laughs) Exactly. And the same thing kind of filters through with like Robinson Crusoe. We get this sort of narrative writing. We have portions of it that are his journal that like then gets lost, blah, blah, blah. And, And then even something like, you know, and I hate to say this, but it's sort of hard to overestimate what a phenomenal writer Jane Austen is if we kind of compare it. Mm-hmm. Because she originally wrote Pride and Prejudice as yeah, an epistolary novel. It's all mostly based on letters. Exactly. Which are still worked, like heavily worked into right. the story itself. It's There's still like that influence there. Yeah, 100%. But I think she probably realized what a clunky format the diary or the letter-based novel right. is. Because there's just certain things... One of my favorite examples of it is when I did my criticism of Dracula. And like, there's this moment where Harker is like in Dracula's castle and he's like, oh no, I got like locked in the, uh, in the crypt or whatever. And like, he's writing in the present moment. (laughs) And I'm like, did you like, before you climb down the outside, like go grab your journal and like a golf pencil (laughs) so that you could stick it in your pocket. So it would be there for you to write about this thing. Pamela has Richardson, Richardson's Pamela has similar problems where it's just, it becomes unbelievable if you're actually imagining oh this person is sitting down and writing this thing yeah although I do think that like the few times that it works there it that not so that it fully works but like works better where I'm not being pulled out it has been in like paranormal mm-hmm. novels and I think that's because you're already suspending disbelief right so you're not like having the same issue I think yeah. when you're writing something that's supposedly very realistic you're like Mm. Okay, but really? Yeah. But, like, if we're having, like, you know, vampire ladies hunting you through, you know, a castle, you're not really getting hung up on the realism of the, you know, yeah. writing. I do admit that I find it more humorous than, like, irritating. Yeah. In- <laughs> yeah. I actually was thinking about this because um, I recently read the novel John Eyre by Mimi Matthews, mm-hmm. which is a mashup of Jane Eyre and Dracula, and is fabulous. Mm-hmm. But I also realized in when we were getting ready for this podcast that... The style it's written in is very, very similar to um, Tenet of the Wild Phil Hall. The opening of the novel is all from the perspective of John Eyre. It's his narrative. And then you have the diary of Bertha Rochester. But it works much, much better. I think one, one reason is, again, it's a paranormal story, so you're not getting real hung up on things. But another aspect I think that makes it work better is instead of going all John Eyre and then all... Bertha, so you're going by, it's actually her diary entries are laced into the narrative. Oh, it's interstitial. Yeah, so like you see like Bertha is this almost like very bitter woman, and then you next chapter you're seeing her as like this 18 year old girl Mm. who's very idealistic, and then you're going back and forth and you're building that character, Mm -hmm. instead of it just being like all or nothing, like right back and forth. And I do think that that actually helped build tension, Yeah. whereas like Ten of the Wild Phil Hall definitely has tension, that format actually builds it more and Mm -hmm. made it feel like less like drawn out where sometimes you're just like i'm because like the narrative of helen does i think lose some of that atmosphere Mm -hmm. that was built up in the front so like if you had those two laced together Mm -hmm. you might have been able to like sustain the atmosphere instead of like all of a sudden we're going from this very atmospheric has a gothic mystery thing to all of a sudden we're like okay now we're in this very like straight to the point right. like abusive relationship and we're trying to deal with that right and you know and it's also so now that i know the context for how jane john Eyre is written there's some other really key differences that i think make this less successful in its storytelling which is that you kind of get to the peak of like their love match and then it's immediately 
interrupted yeah. we're back in the past da, 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 da. and so it's it very jarring in the sense that it's interrupting the natural flow of the narrative right, right, right. arc that yeah. is being set up for us that is very successful up until that point right right yeah i think that i almost feel like i wonder if she had put that at the beginning and we had actually gotten this narrative from beginning to end if it would have been a more successful story yeah i honestly feel like one of the biggest tragedies of anne bronte is she ob she obviously has so much potential. Mm -hmm. I feel like because this book is published like right before she dies. Yeah. If she had had a chance to mature as a writer and kind of work with this in the way we see Jane Austen worked, obviously worked repeatedly with yeah. Pride Prejudice. Like that went through so many renditions. Right. If she had done that, mm -hmm. like I feel like there would have been so much more potential. But right. like she clearly is at this point like an inexperienced writer. Right. And that does show. But like inexperience with like these flashes of brilliance where you're just like oh, this was been so great it. like we were robbed <laughs> yeah. one thing that i do think is really really important though about the diary, diary portion is because feminism is and this novel as a proto-feminist work is so important i do think it's so important that we get helen's perspective in helen's voice as opposed to gilbert relating to us if we had yeah. you know if helen had just told him yeah. The, her background and her story. Which I honestly think, like, that might have just been better instead of, like, putting in the, like, the, like, structure of the diary of just having Helen tell her story. Yeah. Just having it be a first-person narrative. Yeah. I think that might have helped with that, like, mm -hmm. kind of weird, like, phase yeah. you go through in the di in the diary section. Like, mm -hmm. it would have made it feel smoother if she's just like, Gilbert, sit down, let's talk. Let, let me just yeah. tell you what's going on here. Because I feel like a lot of first-person narratives somehow, even though they're the, the person sitting down and telling your story, they don't feel as like choppy and clunky as yeah. like the diary format. Not to bring up a, another novel, which is of contention for Emily, <laughs> maybe like a Frankenstein narrative. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, we don't want to go there. <laughs> Yeah, but I do think that there is still something where, because the external frame of the story is still Gilbert saying, hey, I'm writing a letter, so again, it's this epistolary frame yeah. telling you know his brother-in-law the story of how he got together yeah. with the woman of his love, he, that he's so in love with. So it is, even if she tells her story to Gilbert, it's still framed in his voice and his perspective. That, and I think it true. takes away from the rawness of it being from Helen's perspective and Helen's own voice. And I think I've seen that, a lot of novels though that like fully change the like yeah. perspective. We could like, we could the, get like, chapters. Yeah, like fully uh, now first person, person Helen. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. so like I I feel like there's still the possibility. Although honestly though that is a very modern way of writing yeah. and so like dreaming of Anne doing this is also like a little if bit only, anachronistic yeah right? if only Anne had a laptop or she could go and just delete these things like right. that I am aware that 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 format I think is great but also is not something that really existed mm -hmm. in the same way at that time era right and then I think there's one other thing too that sort of conceptually is going on with this like diary is that and it's partially because I think it ties in with Helen being an artist and being a professional artist. And so she has her own creative voice and she has written and created a thing that is, is an object outside of herself. And one of the things that we see with Gilbert in those early chapters and something that he has to mature out of is how much he objectifies Helen. So oh it's yeah, like, absolutely. You know, she, he follows her over to the cliffside to watch her draw and pretty soon he's just admiring how beautiful she is. Her beauty is clearly the first thing that he's drawn to. Yeah. Which like, that's not like... That's a not a criticism of Gilbert, but like I, he does like clearly like it's a little bit longer than you would like be comfortable with where he transfers from like <laughs> yeah. she's pretty to like, oh, like there's more to her than pretty. Exactly. Like it's a very much. But I mean, that that and again, and, that's part of yeah. how, what he needs to grow, grow through, through as a character. character. Yeah. yeah. And and I don't feel like like there's anything unlikable about Gilbert. Too, no. which I think that that is like a triumph to have a character who's very immature at the beginning, mm -hmm. but you're still like on the journey with him. You're not like, Oh my God, like we're Stop being such a look like horn dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you're like, okay, he's young. He's inexperienced. He got, he, this is like the first woman that he's met. That's not like, you know, one of the country girls, right. you know, that he's accustomed to. So you're not like really judging Gilbert, but you are like, if he didn't, 
If all he ever was into was Helen's beauty, then we would be like, okay. You're lame. Yeah. Just, just stop. You don't dude. deserve her. No, yeah, she's phenomenal. Uh, so basically what the diary does is that she gets to exit the scene and Gilbert has to encounter her narrative in the object. Um, and he's not able to objectify her. He's not able to idealize her or make her, like, you know, this He's just hearing her feelings. Exactly. And that, that sort of classic, you know, angel in the house kind of Victorian ideal. She gets to have her own voice without being objectified. She's not an idol anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And, like, I completely understand that. And I think that's incredibly valid because, yeah. like, she needs her own voice. I think the problem becomes when Helen breaks down and Anne steps in. Yeah. Uh, because... Anne and Helen are very different people. They have different lives. Helen is much wealthier than Anne ever was. Helen has a lot more experience than Anne ever did. Um, so I think we need to like talk about too, like who Anne was, because mm -hmm. I think that's important in like the issues we have with like Helen and Anne kind of right. crisscrossing in and out of the novel and why. Because honestly, like when Anne like loses Helen and becomes the character, right. you honestly truly feel for her. Yeah. Like she is writing out of her pain. Right. So, so like, yeah. So some of the biographical background that we know about Anne is she had an older brother, Branwell, who's not as well known as the other Brontes. And right. part of that is because he actually died quite young. Well, several of them died quite young, but he was a huge disappointment to the family. Right. Um, and not in the sense of like they looked down on him, but he, he had an alcohol problem. He had right. some gambling addictions. He actually ended up having an... He wasn't married, but he had an affair with a woman who was married. And right. all this kind of drama kind of ensued as a result of that entanglement. And it was already a family that like had a lot of pain because their mother died very young. Their father never really recovered from that and was very emotionally distant. And so you have the only other man in the family. And like from Anne's writing, you get this suggestion that like she did love him. Like This right. wasn't a like... I, I wish this person would just get out of my life. No, like she wanted him to, to reform and be a part of their family. Mm -hmm. And so much of that is written into Helen's story about how Helen feels, feels about, about Arthur. Right, right. And you, and you see that and you understand it. And so when like Helen breaks down and comes in, like I can totally feel for her. Like mm -hmm. she's clearly so frustrated and so hurt. But like the problem becomes like, it becomes very clear that she's like, I can't say these things in real life. Right. So I'm going to write them down. Right. And like, while like, you're like, okay, maybe this was therapy for Anne. Like she got to at least say the things that she needed to say. At the same time in the narrative, it's kind of like, this hey. clearly isn't Helen's character speaking to me anymore. This is Anne with a pen. Hear me roar. Yeah. I need to get this out. Then, then in the same aspect, you're like, well, like this isn't like really how you like in essence like convert someone to your idea because mm -hmm. honestly at this point when you're just like speeching at somebody it's kind of like well this is why they're not listening to you because yeah. you're you know giving them a speech honestly i see so i like i obviously grew up on like christian fiction like that was the thing that was really popular when i was growing up and i kind of see like in some instances like proto-christian fiction in this, this sort of sermonizing yeah the sermon because well. like that's been like that was like a huge issue for me in the scene where she's talking to her friend Millicent's husband who is very much like Arthur but not as hard as Arthur is mm -hmm. like he's clear he's got bits and pieces of redeemability in him right and and Helen like jumps into that mm -hmm. and it's like you're happy for Millicent that her husband reforms but it's incredibly unrealistic that especially in this time period Helen can be like let me tell you what's wrong and he he is be like oh, okay, okay let me listen yeah. to this woman oh, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> And like that, that moment to me was like, this is like the foundation for like cheesy sermonized Christian fiction, you know? Yeah. And like, so I was like, those moments like that, I got like very frustrated because not only is Anne suddenly in there and it's not Helen anymore, but like it does become very preachy and like, yeah. you know, real life situations, like people don't like that. Yeah. Like it doesn't do good it things. It doesn't persuade anyone. And I think too, it's, we should talk a little bit about how, you know, as a, English literature sort of encounters the issues of interpreting biographical information about an author into their, their work. work. Yeah. Which like technically it's a no-no. Like you basically just shouldn't do it because you you'd never really know for sure a hundred percent. But with a situation like this with Branwell, it's, so... it's like so apparent yeah. that this is what is informing what Anne is writing. writing about. Right, right. Like I don't think 
like yes you shouldn't Brand do well, it but also like how can you in the cases like this yeah. like how can you not and it's like well in a in an alternate universe where Branwell never had a drinking problem this never would have been written like that's no, ju- there's, been, there's just no way around that yeah like which i mean part of me is like darn what would have been written like what yeah. would we have gotten yeah <laughs> yes so let's take a look, because I think obviously we've kind of been talking around it, this work as sort of like a proto-feminist novel, um, we're kind of, you know, in my opinion, Anne is writing to a, pers- to a feminist perspective that's maybe coming out of the Enlightenment, maybe like, yeah. you know, very much the, um, the, what is it, the Declaration of the Rights of Women, talking about women as being rational humans, that they also should have the right to vote, that they also... Not property, but like actual people. Right. And this and this emphasis on rationality that obviously comes from the Enlightenment. And we see that with, um, with Helen's character, because she shows herself to be this rational character who is a deep thinker, rich, intelligent, blah, blah, blah. She defies the stereotype of women are just emotion. Right. Like she's thinking through these things. Right. Even as like a young girl, as an 18 year old, she's not just like flying into stuff. She's like thinking like, oh, well I can fix this. I can make this. Right. Like she's not just, she's never just pure emotion, which mm-hmm. is obviously the stereotype that carries right. through a lot of fiction far past mm-hmm. this novel. It's not just like this was the time era when we started to figure this out, which is what makes Anne unique because Mm -hmm. like a lot of novels like women are just very emotional yeah (laughs) yeah and we do the way in which you know obviously feminism has developed and changed since this novel is one of the things that you see is like there's almost like well we're separating she's not like other girls we get a little bit of that where it's like i don't remember the girl that gilbert had a crush on and was kind of flirting with before but it's these they're very like oh well she's a different class of woman yeah you know she's a little she comes off as kind of vulgar, mm-hmm. you know, and like, I mean, and kind of cotton headed and kind of yeah. shallow and a, and a and bit she, of an innie. Well, and like all she cares about is like snaring a man. Exactly. Like that's that she's going to go to what are in essence, like very, she's like, cause she's like making up stories about Helen and stuff like that without very, qualms, just because she wants her man. Yeah. Very transparent using her female wilds to, uh, to, to <laughs> snatch up Gilbert. And when that doesn't work, then you trash the other woman. <laughs> That's right. Um, and so this wouldn't necessarily be like fully feminist in the way that we think about it right now, but she's definitely like very early on giving a lot of depth and complexity to this female women, character. Yeah. yeah. And also again, setting up Helen as this professional artist. So she's moving right. into the work sphere. This is like, you know, it's it's a very and, revolutionary in so many and her, ways. And her time. brother, her family yeah. supports this. He's right. not just like, oh, you're bringing we're bringing us down, right? You know, like he like her her like I don't think it ever really does it really get into like her aunt and uncle who are kind of her parent figures like get into that zone. But like her brother, who is family, is actually supporting her right. in this and not saying like, oh, you should just stay with him. Like, yeah, he's abusing you, but yeah. he's your husband and you should be submissive. And, like, no, her brother's like, hey, let's get you out of this yeah. and then I will help you support yourself financially. Right. And one of the things that we still see is that he has to be the intermediary when commerce and business, business actually yeah. happens. Yeah. He's selling her paintings for her, um, which is still like she's not fully entering into the business world. She can't represent herself as an artist. Right. Um, and even there's a bunch of narrative of the way in which she has to sort of obscure her identity, partially because she doesn't want to be found by Arthur. But of course, this kind of ties in with the ways in which like Charlotte Bronte and Anne Bronte couldn't publish under their own Right, right. Too. They named, was it Acton Bell, I think yeah. it was? Yeah. 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 And I mean, obviously Jane Austen doing the same thing. I mean, she did publish under like as a, a lady, lady yeah. but even still like the idea that like there needs to be some level of separation between women and like the Commerce. professional yeah. yeah, world. But like also you take it for what it is and the time area, what it is. And you're yeah, just like, like, we made it this far. Yeah. We made it this far. <laughs> one small step for mankind. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. And then of course we also get this very feminist narrative in the way that the male suitors are articulated for Helen and for Helen to kind of there. Some of them are a little bit of flat characters. So Helen can just be like, no, you're a jerk. I don't like like you. Don't do that to women. You know, that's bad. (laughs) Um, but we kind of have this, like this, row, if you will, of dominoes of male suitors, and we get to see how she Helen is very desirable. Yeah, <laughs> a exactly. lot of men desire her. <laughs> Obviously, yes, yes, she's 
she's got it going on. And so, of course, the first one is, of course, Arthur Hennington. We've kind of talked about that relationship. But as she's getting ready to leave, there's another man who kind of, like, comes in between. He's, like, the in-between Gilbert and Arthur. Yeah, like, he's... a he's, potential suitor. He's... I forgot his name. Do you remember his name? He's the neighbor. So Gilbert gets two opportunities to sort of say, like, well, you know, maybe we should get together anyway. And Helen's like, no. We can't get together anyway. My faith is very important to me. I'm not going to violate this sort of standard for myself. Yada, yeah. yada, yada. And then um, and then he gets the second opportunity to actually propose to her. And then, oh, do they have another conversation after that? And he's like, yes, I understand. You're right. We should be fine. We should separate. I and mean, he, he does agree with her. But yeah. like, And then that's when the diary transition happens. And so then when we get the neighbor and he has two shots at her. And the first time fine. she says like, no, we can't get together. It's immoral, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go there with you. And then he comes back and says, like, but you really should anyway. And he basically threatens her, right? Right. So the first time is like, hey, are you interested? And the second time is like, well, I'm going to, you know, da-da-da, because I'm a man and I have power. So you have to get with me because I yeah. know, you know. Which is a contrast to Gilbert being exactly. like, being like, you know you what? what? Upon I hear reflection, you. reflection, I agree with I you. Hear, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Right. And I'm not going to, like... Which is the moment when I think for like, that's like a huge moment for Helen because she finally is finding someone who's like willing Willing to to. listen to her. Exactly. So I wonder if the point of improvement is actually giving her fewer speeches to Huntington so that these two moments with the duplication can shine better and you're not so tired of her speechifying because leading up to the neighbor, she's been speechifying and sermonizing to Arthur this entire time. And so by the time you get here, you're tired of hearing her diatribes. Right. So that, anyway, that's a random thought that I had. But that pretty much wraps yeah, up what I got yeah. to say on that. Like, no, that's, I mean, that is an interesting point. Like, it's a good contrast. And, like, I think that, like, the neighbor is, I just call him the neighbor all the time now because I can't remember. Just the neighbor. The neighbor is a good contrast to Gilbert and, like, it would, like, I think has a possibility to help, like, understand, like, Helen, you know, while she obviously has an attraction to Gilbert, why she's like, no. Yeah. Like, from, cause Helen's fairly hesitant for the whole thing. Yeah. It's not, it's not just like, we're great friends and then you say you love me and then I'm like, oh, oh shoot. No. Like, yeah. she's, she's hesitant. hesitant. Yeah. Yeah. The whole she's like, through. I don't even think we could be friends. Like, right. Da, da, da. So, but then I want to also comment more on your previous point about Charlotte's feelings about this novel. And, you know, it was, there's so much that's there that's worth talking about that scholars have talked about, um, which is, you know, A, both Charlotte and Emily were like, oh boy, <laughs> this is a heavy hit novel on about 16 different topics that like Victorian yeah. society is not ready to hear. Yeah. <laughs> they, you know, very much perceive Anne as being a wallflower, as being quiet. Clearly, she has this inner strength and this, like, very powerful voice that wants to come out, even if her personality was a little bit more reticent in person. Well, I think that's why it comes out so strong (laughs) in the book, because I feel like she was probably not able to get it out in person. Yeah. And it probably, it might have, like, if she had lived longer and had a chance to, like, vocalize things, it pro- that alone might have improved the writing of it. Yeah. And so there were lots of reasons why they were very concerned, A, about it being published in the first place, B, republication, C, yeah. like, obviously Charlotte had some concerns about the quality of the book, even though I think, I mean, the thing is, is, like, the it's... I feel like the book is so important in the role that it plays, that it is in history Mm -hmm. and how much of the, even if it's like flawed as a work of, of art, um, it's like, I'm really glad, I'm really glad that it's with us. No, I think it's an important part of history and I'm sure it's been an influential part of history. Like, like I don't. I th- I don't think there's any denying that this was like the beginning of something. Yeah. Something that took a real long time to get going. <laughs> yeah. But it is like in a way the beginning of something and it's something that survived. Again, there has been there I I think one time I read that like 300,000 books a year are published. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of books that are published we forget about the year after they're published and yeah. that is certainly as much true then as it is today. Right. And I think there's a reason that we still are reading this book and discussing it. Yeah. So any final thoughts on the book? Anything else you wanted to share? I do want to say that, like, I think there is value in reading it. Yeah. I'm not saying, like, don't read this novel. Yeah. I would say you have to go into it understanding where it comes from. And mm-hmm. I think that I think that if you can understand some things beforehand, it won't be as frustrating because yeah. you know where the author is coming from. Also, like, 
she wasn't an experienced writer and this is her working stuff out, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, I do think there's value in reading it. I think it's just good to know that like, this is, this is not Jane Eyre. Yeah. Jane Eyre (laughs) as like a plotted novel, as a narrative structure, as like characters is just, and there's a reason why it's been adapted like a 10,000 times times, and like Tenet has been adapted like twice, (laughs) you know, which it has been adapted. Um, but like just the bones of it are much more conventional. (laughs) I I do think like Jane Eyre still has things to say. Mm -hmm. It just says it in a way that doesn't overshadow it as a novel. Exactly. Like it functions as both it. Cause all, all books have something to say. Right. There's very few, I like, I have read like super cheap, like yeah. you know genre fiction and it still has something to say yeah. so like that's not a problem yeah. i don't have a problem with the book ha- could you try again oh, that's, <laughs> that's my siri sorry yeah. uh i i don't have a problem with the novel trying to say something like yeah. and and i think what she's trying to say is important i feel like what it's saying about like women's place in society and like the struggles there are probably more important than the like i hate alcohol because sometimes that's just like <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Any and thoughts? I, yeah. I think the only final thought that I have on this is like, I do think it's very interesting that at the close of the novel, you know, we wrap up Helen's narrative. We go back to Gilbert's perspective as he's talking about now, I'm going to go back and get back with, you know, Helen, we're going to get married. Um, and that she also then, she recedes into the background of the narrative. She recedes into marriage, into this conventional role. She's no longer painting professionally. And so her identity as an artist and as a creator also kind of recedes into the background. Mm. And we never really hear from Helen again. This is true. And that, and that whole thing is, you know, obviously we want that parallelism, that frame out. But I think it says something really interesting about the underlying conservatism that's still in mm. Anne's mm. worldview. World. Right. about the role of feminism. Like women should definitely be, you know, appreciated as human beings and given respect and given autonomy and uh, respected for the things that they have to say and listened to. And yet she's still reinstantiating these sort of very traditional gender roles. Which, okay, I think one thing we should bring up about mm-hmm. Anne was that she did work. Yeah. Like Anne was a governess. She mm-hmm. did like work and earn a living and stuff yeah. like that. So she does, Anne herself is like and she's a professional author and she's a professional author so she is like in a way living some of her own principles yeah but not like quite as fully as like we yeah. would all wish her to or we yeah, would as modern her, women as modern women or yeah. as like even like i think we would like to see like i mean i would have loved to have seen been like i mean i will say like in a way, Helen does end in a position of power, right? Because yeah. she's a very wealthy woman now. She's yeah. of a higher society than Gilbert. Like, she does end in a position of power. Yeah. But I think we, as modern women, would have preferred to also see her as, like, continuing her yeah. her independence into, yeah. as well. Her autonomous power, not just her structural her power. power. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so that's all I have to say about it. Yeah. Great book. Yeah. Everybody should check it out. If just you're... Ready to be a little bit patient with it. <laughs> yeah. And and if you like the other Bronte sisters, I feel I still think like it's a really interesting like contribution. To like well, like to see how like these three girls like grew up in the exact same house. They have very similar lives, like they all work as mm-hmm. governesses, they all go to like the same school and all of these different things. Right. To see like how different each one of their voices is. Like yeah. that in and of itself I think is really just an yeah. interesting read right yeah. there. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this podcast first episode. Let us know in the comments down below if you have any of the thoughts on the 16 topics that we brought up today, or if you have any books that you would like us to talk about or topics about reading that you'd like us to tackle. That would be great. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.